Hello, wherever you are in the world today, welcome to Beyond the Art in our series, The Stories That Carry Us. I'm your host, Cray Beaumont Flynn, a citizen of the Cherokee Nation and the Delaware Tribe of Indians. In each episode, we will discuss with various Native American artists, influencers, art leaders, and everyone in between their experiences, the communities they serve, and the translation and interpretation of the Native American art world today. All right. So, hi, Kelly. How are you today? I'm doing good, Cray. How are you? I'm doing good. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I really want to appreciate you uh, joining our show today, Beyond the Art. And um, I want to introduce Kelly Church to our listeners. And again, what is the specific name of your tribe that you belong to? I belong to the Machibinashewish tribe in Michigan, and we also are known as the Gun Lake tribe. The Gun Lake tribe, that's a lot easier to roll off my tongue, that's for sure. Uh, Well, thank you for coming, and we really enjoy you being a part of our show. So why don't you just tell me a little bit about some of the art and what got you started in uh, creating art, Native American art? Okay, well, um, first I was born Native American, so that's where it kind of started. I'm joking. But um, Hmm. I literally uh, (laughs) come from a basket weaving family here in Michigan, but uh, we create black ash baskets. It really wasn't kind of where I started at, though. I, um, you know, saw people make baskets or were always baskets in homes and stuff. But I wanted to go um, doing paintings for quite a while. I go to college and I did painting. I did sculpture. I was and then I started you're, taking care of my uh, grandparents. You're a Renaissance woman. <laughs> yeah. Well, when I started taking care of my grandparents, my grandfather would always talk about baskets. So somebody might bring over a meal or mow the lawn or do something to help him. And I used to hear him, you know, look out the window and say, we need to make that man a basket. We need to make that lady a basket. So I saw that making baskets was his biggest way of saying thank you. So one day I went to my dad and mm-hmm. his name was Bill Church. And I said, hey, dad, uh, grandpa wants to make baskets for people to say thank you. Can we um, go get a tree to make some? And so my dad is like this person who um, doesn't make appointments. He's a fly by the minute kind of person. And he's like, yeah, let's go. And literally, like within five minutes, we were in the car. We were driving to the woods to go harvest a tree. And we weren't driving close either. We were going two hours away where he knew where trees were at his hunting spot. So he just did that. I just said I needed to be back by three. We went up there. He showed me how to identify a black ash tree. He showed me how to chop it down, how to pound it, split it, scrape it. My daughter Cherish got out of school at three o'clock and I said, hey, I want to show you something. And I could not do one thing. Because it's really acquired skills. You need to practice on your pounding, practice on your splitting, your scraping. And so I worked for about another year after that with my dad and my cousin, John Pigeon. And um, my life just became all about black ash. There you go. So you got you got down and dirty with uh, the black ash and creating your craft. Yeah, it's the only way to get the materials, though, here in Michigan. If we want to weave baskets, Mm -hmm. we have to find a tree. And so that's how it goes. We do classes, you know, every now and then. But even then, if they're like, I want to make a bigger basket, you know, I might tell them, well, go pound down the log or let's uh, let's go find a tree back when we could find them a little easier. And now, since I'm not a Gun Lake uh, tribal member, I'm Cherokee in Delaware. Is uh, black ash indicative of the Gun Lake tribe in creating their their basket weaving? It is. So black ash only grows in the Northeast United States and southeastern Canada. All of the natives in these regions mm-hmm. use black ash for their um, basket weaving. It's very um, cultural. It's spiritual. It's very traditional. Um, creation stories begin with black ash. We um, have some medicines that you can make with black ash when we have ceremonies or maybe wedding ceremonies or events that are special. We use our black ash baskets. So it's very, very significant to us. It's um, something that is just part of us. And so our people in the Gun Lake area have been making baskets, you know, for thousands of years. 
we have, uh, they have found basket fragments that have been preserved by metal in upper state New York, and it was black ash. So we have been making these baskets for thousands of years. Here in Michigan, uh, we have a picture that goes back to 1919, actually during the last pandemic, of my family weaving baskets. So we can prove 100 um, years with that. Wow, but my grandma great. always said, we made baskets before they made cameras. <laughs> Well, I mean, any type of Native American artistry is a story. It tells a story of the culture, the people, their surroundings, Mother Earth. Um, and it's also a legacy item that, you know, families pass down from generation to generation. Now, in your basket weaving, are you taking elements that are traditional to the Gun Lake tribe? Or are you kind of reinterpreting and retranslating into a modern design? Yeah, I think I'm doing what our people have always done. Um, back when they were making these utilitarian baskets 100 years ago, it was out of necessity and need. And then as non-Native mm -hmm. people began right. to move into the area more, my grandfather said they began making more fancy baskets. And, you know, the ones that non-Native <laughs> people would collect because they like to put them on their shelves and look at them where we use them. And then right. today, I like to see it that I'm using the same exact traditional harvesting methods and ways of getting my material. And I'm weaving with the same methods. The only thing I'm doing different is um, using it to create shapes that I'm familiar with today or to tell my stories of today. Mm -hmm. So I think in every generation, we've done the same thing. We've done uh, the traditions use the black ash in the way that we needed to at that time. That's good because you're, you're, it's like a living museum. You're, you're incorporating a living history by continuing that effort and creating. Do you feel that since you were taught by your father, that a lot of the younger native American youth are losing that connection because they're not really being taught the old ways. It's more about the new ways. And it's not being I guess, um, reinterpreted for their, for their interest, I guess, or their passion. Yeah. Um, I think here in Michigan, we're pretty fortunate that we've always done black ash in a very traditional way that we've always taken our children into the woods when they've learned, taught them how to, um, get, uh, you know, identify a tree in the woods. Where do they grow? What do they look like? You know, you have to harvest it. How do we get them out of the woods? We carry them out on our shoulders. How do you pound it and how do you pound mm -hmm. correctly? So in Michigan, we've always been forced to, like I told you, if we want to weed baskets, we have to get a tree. No one's going to do that um, laborious work for you. But there are opportunities sometimes yeah. through tribes. You where can't I go down to the corner them. store and buy it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. But, you know, sometimes <laughs> I say, boy, if I could, I might go to that corner store because it is we, we spend right. like days looking <laughs> sometimes and and sometimes my husband might be too tired to pound but but when you get done um it really makes you feel good about where you started what you've done all of the whole process um really comes together and i do think this future generation is missing out on it a lot because of the decimation of our trees with the emerald ash borer in the old days and when i say old days i'm only going back like um 10 years in Michigan, up till about mm -hmm. 2013, 2015, we could harvest trees downstate um, where where we lived. But now all of our trees are decimated to the point that they're not there anymore or they're trying to regenerate and regrow, but they're definitely not big enough to harvest. So before we could bring our kids into the woods and teach them these things, now we're looking at um, taking people with us to find trees and what if we don't after a few days. So now it's a little bit more difficult to pass that on and our youth are missing those opportunities. So there are ways to counteract this that we are looking at and mm -hmm. exploring and we're always looking at ways to sustain it, but um, it's not as easy as it used to be. Do you think it's a responsibility as for us as tribal members to push that connection to the youth so they do feel connected to Mother Earth and what our ancestors did. Since they're not losing or they're not learning uh, the arts in school per se, but you know, some tribes are instituting educational programs both in language, the arts, and other aspects of their culture. Do you think it's it's our responsibility as native 
tribal members to kind of instill that into our youth and not let it go to the wayside? Mm -hmm. I do. I fully and wholeheartedly do. I believe that um, these things would have been more common and every day for us had we not had the boarding school institutionalized days, you know, where they took our kids and tried to take all of that away. So, if you know, you imagine 86 percent mm-hmm. of our children were in that mindset to where this was something that you were punished for doing or you were not taught to do. And I always try to impress upon people too. imagine being in an elementary school and having a graveyard outside of your school. Nobody has that today. And then Mm -hmm. knowing that those are your classmates. So the things that they were punished for was their language, their culture, you know, and those were some of the things that they um, decided not to do for those reasons. And that is why it was mostly not passed on. But those 14 percent and some of those that just, you know, plowed through that school and kept their traditions they kept it for us and so it is our responsibility to pass it on and i believe that it it is something that is part of us who we are as native people Mm -hmm. it's not just something we do we have language and words that um um talk all about our black ash traditions and our language is always the basis of um, who humans are. That's our first connection to um, mm. who we are as people. And, you know, just imagine losing a whole part of your culture. So those words would be lost and you would never use them again. You know, it goes a lot um, deeper than right. just the culture, the traditions. It goes into the language. And it is our responsibility to show our future generations that have not had the opportunities that we have had today today. Um, that um, what is available to them, what belongs to them, and what is theirs to take part in, should they choose to do so. Right, right. It's again it goes back to that connection and that responsibility. Uh, is there a program up in your area to uh, reforge, reforce uh, black ash in the landscape? Um, you know growth? what? The, the emerald ash borer is a very hardy bug, so it will eat uh, black ash trees about an inch in diameter. So at this point in our forest in the lower part of Michigan, the trees that are seeding mm-hmm. or have seeded in the past five to seven years, those seeds take about two years to germinate. So those will naturally um, regenerate and germinate. And then we'll see if the emerald ash borer is still in those areas because it will either eat those um, seedlings when they get to be an inch or too big or it won't. So at this point, while we used to go harvest trees and we would um, replant seeds at the same time, we save those seeds now for mm-hmm. future generations to replant in hopes that um, we can bring that back. The The seeds will be viable for 25 to 30 years. So that gives us a good opportunity. And we are starting from scratch. And then you have to wait for about 20 to 30 years for those trees to grow large enough to harvest for baskets. So we're really looking um, far ahead, but we are looking ahead. And we're also, um, you know, I'm confident that the future generations will bring it back. Some of the youth I work with today will replant those seeds, you know, and teach others in the future. And I'm also more hopeful that we will not lose every single tree and that we will be able to continually harvest instead. That's the the bigger hope. Fantastic. Yeah, that's hopeful, I think, for on a global scale (laughs) of the mass destruction that we've uh, put on this earth and we're losing amounts a huge amounts of natural resources you know be it trees and the birds and every being native american we have a connection to mother earth i think uh, that is part of uh, instilled in us at early age that it's part of our dna that to appreciate it and respect it and if you take you give back um do you think that we as native americans have a responsibility um to self-represent some of our history and our artistry? Uh, or do you think we kind of um, translate it so it's more viable to a wider audience? You know, I think on both parts. Does that I make think, sense? Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know if I'll interpret okay. it the same way. Sometimes I interpret stuff very literal, but um, well, I think on both parts. I well, think the, the balls in my head were like bouncing around. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, well, we'll work good together then. Um, I think that as yeah. a native uh, artist, I can help share my history of my people with my people, but also on that wider scale. You know, native history is hardly ever told. Who knows real native history? Only our own tribal people. And in, in, in that respect, it's not like our whole tribe, but our tribes are based on our history. Mm -hmm. So our history has been figured out and it has been told. It's just a matter of, is it passed on? We have a lot of oral stories that we have, you know, that have those teachings in them that are passed on. And we don't record those, um, you know, in writing because we say that we might forget our stories if they are written down so we continue to do them orally. So that's kind of like our rule with our storytelling that, you know, we begin to do in the wintertime. With our history, though, our histories are written down. And I do see that it's something that our children really don't know because it was my grandmother who knew her history. She was living it and they didn't belong to a federally recognized tribe, but they were native. And then it, my dad comes along and he's learning his history and he's helping tribes get recognized. My dad was actually a native historian and he helped uh, six tribes in Michigan get recognized in the tribe wow. I belong to today. He did the history for. So if you go to BIA.gov and punch in Bill Church Gun Lake tribe, you can mm -hmm. read the history of my tribe that my dad did the research for. So Fantastic. it was just during my dad's generation, our tribes were becoming recognized. Then I'm 11 years old and my tribe becomes recognized and I become an official tribal member in the eyes of the States, United States. But then our children today are born into this. They're just born into it. They don't know mm -hmm. the history of how of the things that have happened because they're untold. Our um, own country has not recorded the history of our boarding schools and such. Why not? Yeah, it's embarrassing for them, but it right. happened. Mm -hmm. And this is how you don't repeat things in the future. Mm -hmm. So for me, history is huge. It's important. Every time we have a person that pretends they're native and sells their story and people buy it, it is writing a history that is not true in histories that have not yet been told. So I'm very adamant about our histories being told. Our history is being told by us, not interpretations of what we tell other people. And I believe we are fully capable Correct. of telling our own histories, writing, writing our own history books. And our uh, schools in the United States um, usually don't incorporate our history here in Michigan this year. They get the choice, the option to include our history. I don't think oh, it wow. should be an option. I That's think fantastic. it should be no, recommended. I don't think, yeah, agree. I think it should be part of it and I mm -hmm. think it should be part of it everywhere. So that's where this, my generation and the next one comes along to just make this more normal and um, help everyone learn their history. I'll be passing in on all I can in my baskets. I try to tell about issues that are happening. Um, I had a, actually a native American Anishinaabe history hat that I just made last year. That was in my art show at the grand Rapids oh, wow. art museum. And so, yeah, telling history is very important. We can capture those things in our art for the Native audi audiences and for the wider ones um, at large. Correct. And, and again, some of the artistry that is created, be it pottery, be it basket weaving, being it weaving and, and such, it is telling a story and, it is, and is, um, it's part of our history that we should be telling. Um, as we move forward and we grow, but we're still to continually, continually to grow as a culture. Uh, just because it was set 200 years ago, doesn't mean it stopped. <laughs> we're still around. I'm here. You're here. So obviously, exactly. you know, our culture and our art and our everything that we use in our e everyday life is continuing on as a native American. So tell me a little bit about your process. When you start creating something, you have something in your mind, are you grabbing from the past? Are you grabbing from an experience? Or is there a distinct story you're trying to tell and represent in your artistry? You know, I love your questions because you just kind of like, you know, uh, encapsulate <laughs> my answer all at once because it's kind of all three. I'm starting from the past because I'm literally yeah. using the same traditions and teachings and ways to get my material that we did thousands of years ago before this country was a country. I always mm -hmm. like to, you know, um, tell people. And then I'm um, right. working on issues that affect me today. 
And so when I start creating those shapes, they're not shapes from the past that are utilitarian, you know, like the fishing creels, because I'm not using it for fishing. What I'm using my baskets for are to um, share a story of what we are, um, of what what is happening uh, to us today. A lot of my baskets um, started telling stories about the Emerald Dashboard because it was something really important to me. But it also, while it was affecting us and our loss of basketry, it was also affecting the landscape mm-hmm. of our um, woods and the, you know, the deer, they like to eat the ash trees and our um, certain birds live in ash trees. So it was also affecting everybody else on a wider scale. So when you can find some commonality with everybody, then you can get them to listen. You know, if I'm telling them, hey, the Emerald Dashboard is going to make me lose baskets, they might not care. Maybe they don't like baskets. But if you tell them we're losing the ash trees and it's making the water tables rise in our forests and, you know, then start, you know, giving them something that might affect them, then it becomes an issue for everyone. So in my um, Mm -hmm. baskets, I incorporate metals and photographs and different things that people can identify with. The metals are usually to make them shiny. And, you know, shiny, pretty stuff is easier to tell a story with something pretty than it is (laughs) with a basket that has a bug in it. You know, um, if I have this pretty basket that draws you in to want to look at it, then you open it and there's a bug in there. You're more inclined to ask why that bug is in there and and want to hear the story about it. Then if I just pull that bug out of my purse and be like, hey, guess what this bug's doing? You know, so (laughs) it's all about a surprise for you. (laughs) Yeah. Right. (laughs) So in in your storytelling, in your, your craft, are you taking from distinct historical stories or are you kind of reincorporating them to today's audience so they can interpret it and kind of i guess connect better to it yeah thanks so um and that would be for I'm the native little, and the non-native yeah i'm doing a little bit of both so it's important for um our native people to understand um our issues our culture our traditions and our teachings that are there for us, but it's also, um, like I was saying, you know, I try to mix the two together. If, you know, like it's not just about basket weaving, it's about the water tables rising and the loss of the trees and the oxygen that we'll have in the future. So I do try to incorporate the um, two of them together. Like if I had a treaty hat that I did, I do a lot of treaty hats. So these treaty hats tell you about our history And it tells you about, you know, like the coming of the non-native people and us signing treaties. What do these treaties mean? Well, probably Mm -hmm. not many people know what those treaties mean. But to us, those treaties mean this is what you promised us. So in these treaty hats, I do a lot of, um, you know, like um, protecting our water. We had a, a, what's it, a court case with our state of Michigan in the 70s. They didn't like us fishing under our fishing rights with our treaties. And so they took us to the Supreme Court. Well, um, little, not a lot of people know that when you go to federal court, it's going to be um, Supreme Court is always first and then tribes and then states. Right. So tribes are always going to trump the state when it comes to things like that because we are our own sovereign nations. So um, things like right. this are the kind of things I like to tell in my stories. You know, why is water important to us? Our treaty rights, it begins there. And our fishing rights are important. Keeping the water clean, removing Pipeline 5 um, is important to all of us for clean drinking water. So I'm always trying to incorporate a message into them. But don't get me wrong. I have uh, I love having a sense of humor And I love telling jokes and just um, laughing. So I also will do some baskets that are just meant to be funny. And then some um, I just wake up and I think about, like, I'm actually working on one now about the morning and the stars in the morning time. So um, it just depends on what strikes me and um, where, where where I'm going. And sometimes I can be going like three different directions at once or five or 10. And then I got to hone it in and decide which one I'm going to finish first and then (laughs) how I'm going. That's the the way the creative mind works. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. What, what piece can you really say is like, wow, 
you didn't expect that from yourself. And it was like, I, you made yourself when it was done and completed. It's like, wow, this is, this is, this is amazing. This is a, my piece of resistance, you know? Yeah. Uh, you know, that's funny. Um, when I look at them and I finish, I always have that visual in mind of what that piece will look like. And then when I complete it, mm -hmm. it, it needs to look like what it looked like in my mind. So um, I like to say that most pieces get there. Some of them, they don't look just like in my mind. And then I say, next time I know what I'll do different. You know, so um, right. I can't really say like any piece when I got done, I'm like, whoa, you are just the best thing I've ever done. Because I like to think that they're all <laughs> equally well made. But um, when I finished with the piece that's at the Art Institute of Chicago and the one that I did in hoops, uh, for hearts of our people, those were mm -hmm. two baskets. When I finished with them, I had these thoughts in my mind. And when I got done, it was like, whoa, you are um, very pretty when you're photographed, you know, or, you know, like I don't look at my work and think, <laughs> wow, that's a really beautiful basket. It's a different way to look at your own work. But when you see your work after right. it's finished and someone takes it and puts it in an exhibition it, you see your work in a different way. You know, like I know it's my basket. I know I've seen it, but I've never seen it like that. So those were two baskets where when they went on exhibition, when I saw them, I, I kind of was um, wowed by them after. Not when I got done making them, but after they were sold and they were presented to other people and I saw them like the other people. And those are two baskets where, um, when I saw, like, them, wow, I did that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, Oh, that's way more beautiful than I remember, you know, and, and uh, it's their presentation <laughs> as much as, as much as the basket. Why do you think we're on the upswing right now of the interest in native American art? It seems to go into cycles like five to 10 years, you know, there's a lull and then all of a sudden we're the it factor and then it goes down and then we come back up. Why do you think that is? Have you seen a change? Have you seen the upswing and you know, movement since you started your craft? No, you know what? For me, I'm not a, um, one of those people that have always been um, sought after and collected by museums. So I would not notice that ebb and flow. I mostly over my art career mm -hmm. have been like making things that I want to make and, and my messages and then hope that someone will love that message as much as me and buy it. And so I'm, that's kind of been like my, um, you know, I don't really notice those things like you're talking about, but I've noticed over the pandemic that I started selling um, quite a bit of art. And so that was an odd time for me. Cause I'm like, I'm home. I'm not going anywhere. I just barely got internet for the first time at my house in August during the pandemic. Cause I started realizing we're just <laughs> going to be at home. The library was closed, you know, all year. And I really didn't have any way to communicate. So that was the first time I got um, my internet. So it really um, uh, isn't anything that I've um, been into delved into. I live on a dirt road. I like to tell people that then you just kind of understand everything from there. I'm kidding. <laughs> but I noticed during the pandemic, <laughs> I started selling a lot more art during the pandemic and it was an odd time. But I think that after what happened to George Floyd, that um, museums and institutions uh -huh. became a little bit more woke about um, the underlying uh, racism in America. I'm just going to say it like that because it exists. It mm -hmm. is there. And I feel like it's always been so common. Some things have always been so normal and common that it's not even looked at like being racist. And so those are the kind of things that we need to undo and on um, and break mm -hmm. and, and some examples i'll give you is as a native american person i was told when i went to graduate school by a graduate professor that i spoke articulate english for being native american and i just thought that was crazy for him to say that to me in the first place but then i told him well i have three doctors of pharmacy in my family and we all speak good english because it was something that was an unbiased uh, or a biased uh, kind of like, you know, deep rooted racism in him that he didn't even realize that he was doing while he was saying that to me. And I would say that was a long time right. ago, Craig. But then um, just a few years ago, I was speaking in Kansas. And when we got done, we spoke to the audience. And again, somebody said that to me. 
They said, you speak really articulately for being Native American. And I'm thinking, what do they think we speak like? I'm not sure. But there it is. It's a generalization. It's a stereotype. (laughs) It's something that they have seen in cowboy shows, how, how, or whatever they see Native speaking like. And um, that's their perception of us. And this man, too, he actually asked me, where do Natives work? And I was really surprised. I said, well, I have um, some family members. They work in hospitals as pharmacists. And then he said, but I'm a pharmacist. And I said, so are we. And, you know, and that right there, they don't think we have normal jobs. They don't uh, think we speak articulately. So these are the kind of barriers that we're still breaking through. And that is the kind of um, underlying um, racism that we still deal with today. And it's ongoing. And, it, it, and again, I think it's partially our fault because we are not telling our own story. We're letting others tell the story and we're not being as adamant in telling our story. I think in the last two years, three years, I think we've, we've gotten better, uh, both in the social media and films and television and such. But again, like you said, I've been approached when I tell someone I'm Native American, well, where do you guys live? What kind of place do you live in? It's like, uh, <laughs> A house? <laughs> oh, oh. Down the street from <laughs> you. Where do you go to school? Yeah, a school. You yeah. know, they're just, it, especially in the outside world, you know, globally, um, which kind of leads me to my next question I want to ask you. It's like, there's still that, that vision and interpretation that we're wild Indians running around on the plains, you know, and that we all live in teepees and wear feathered headdresses. It's like, Okay, that was probably one small factor of one percent of all the Native American cultures um, in this country. It just amazes me that that's still very prolific um, in the outside global world. I, I think the question I have is how can it be improved so Native American tribal culture isn't so homogenous and still play a key role in the global art community that we're looked at distinctly, distinctively as at the same level as other artists that are coming out of New York or Europe or anywhere else in the world, that this culture, this distinct and varied culture in this one country can play with the big boys on a global scale. Yeah. um, I think that we have to have the right people working behind the scenes to make that happen. And what I'm saying is, you know, we need some more native curators Um, First, I want to kind of address what you were saying about, you know, we haven't been telling our own stories because I feel like we have been telling our own stories, but we have not been being listened to. If we write a history book and someone else, uh, a scholar writes that history book, they're going to take that scholar and publish it first. And um, I'm saying that because uh, there's been instances back home where we have tried to get things together and start stuff and non-native people can always get it going easier. And so it's, it's a matter of, um, not giving us the, the capability, thinking that we have the capabilities to do those things. And so I think that, um, when people start giving us those, uh, capabilities listening, I think the movies have been there, but they haven't had the opportunity to put those Mm -hmm. movies out in such a public way. I think our history tellers have been there like my dad, but he's never been um, heard on a global scale. So I think those things have been there. Um, And how do we um, become like everybody else in the art world? Um, Back to your question. I think that goes back to the curators that we have. Because it's the curators that I find um, working with museums that are the first face of working with artists. They're the ones that are out looking in the world for the artists. They're the ones discovering them, seeing them, noticing them, and giving them um, the recognition in the end. Now, recognition can be in a few different ways. It can be when they just buy your art. Because more commonly, I've had my art bought by museums, and it might go um, on display in an exhibition, or it might not. It might just sit in the collection room but I'm always really honored that a museum owns my art still because to me it can still be seen by our future generations when they visit that museum and they ask to see those collections it's in a global place that all people are um, have accessibility to so there's one way that our art Mm -hmm. can be seen 
but um, to start to be seen um, as commonplace and with everybody else, like from Europe and on a bigger scale, it does take um, the museum to start to see us that way and look at our artwork in the same way. I think often we've always been in the natural history museums and that's where they kind of start out because right. they think of us in the past. But um, I have a, a mm -hmm. piece now and I'm just so honored to, it's still kind of surreal for me. So, but it is one of these stepping stones that you're asking about. So it kind of applies at the art Institute of Chicago. Right. Um, Andrew Hamilton is the curator who purchased a basket of mine and then they renovated their galleries this year. They recognized that their galleries have been the same for 30 years and 30 years ago was not the same as today. So they took their, took their Edward Hopper painting, Nighthawks, and they placed it in the back of the gallery where it used to be in the center by itself, in the back of the gallery. And on either side of it is an African-American artist and a woman artist that um, were in their collections and mm -hmm. had not been shown in that way before. So they renovated the whole gallery with um, other people, including them. And they included that basket that they bought from me. And so um, when he told me the galleries were being renovated, it was going to be in the gallery and Edward Hopper's painting was in that gallery. I didn't really know who Edward Hopper was and I know I should have, but I didn't. I did know the painting though, Nighthawks. So I was familiar with mm -hmm. that. And um, when he said Nighthawk, I didn't know the name of it, but I knew the painting. So when I looked it up online and I was like, oh, whoa, I know that painting. But when I went to see that piece, it was one of those instances where I walked in and I saw my basket and I knew my basket, but I was like, wow, that basket really looks wow there. But I'm in the gallery <laughs> with all those other people, Cray. There's Brant Woods around the corner and, you know, Edward Hopper's there. And there's also Maria Martinez, one of our um, really celebrated native potters that is no longer with us, but her pottery will always live on. So there's all of these um, people and we're all together. And this is um, like what you're talking about. This can be done. I think the Art Institute of Chicago is very... Um, forward thinking. They're they're setting the the space and the place for this to happen. They're setting a um, you know, an example, right. a tone that we all belong. We are all the same. I am Native American, but I also live in a, a, an America that's dominated by non-Native people. Even though every day we are all on Native land, every single day this is Native land, exactly. but it is dominated mm -hmm. by non-Native people. But we are all part of the um, American uh, life and American Collective. scene, and therefore American <laughs> art. Right. You mentioned uh, some of the artists. Are, are those influences of yours? Do you have an art artist influencer that you kind of look to and kind of I want to say idolize, but like, wow, I want to achieve not so much their that prominence, but execution or. No, you know what? Not really for um, my my particular. Yeah. I just kind of do what I do and then figure out how I'm going to do it. But I have favorite artists. <laughs> and my favorite artist, my first Native artist that I um, just am enamored with. And to this day, I'm still enamored. Like if I get around her, I, I turn into that goofy girl. But is Roxanne Swensel. She's a potter. And I just fell in love with her art be because of her story. She had this story about not really being able to articulate herself um, verbally. And so she would use her clay in that way. And I have a nephew who has cerebral palsy and he's very good at articulating himself in many ways, but maybe not necessarily verbally. So I fell in love with her art like in 95, 96 and um, um, she's someone that I've always followed since then. I have um, painters. Uh, Van Gogh has always been one of my favorite painters, which made me fall in love with Chanteau Begay because his art reminds me of Van Gogh. But of course, when I painted, I didn't mm. paint like that. So I'm not influenced by artists in that way, but I have artists that I am enamored with. I love, I follow them. Actually, um, Holly Wilson, she might be from your tribe. She's Delaware. She's a sculptor. And she's mm -hmm. another person. I just love her stuff. So, yeah, there are people that I really um, do. I, I look online just to see what they're creating. Right. So is, do those artists and others motivate you to create? 
yeah, I think, you know, everybody, I'm always motivated to create without anyone telling me to. I think it's just in my blood and what I want to do. But I think um, when I see things like, you know, Holly, she's a really um, contemporary artist. You know, she's telling her native stories mm -hmm. with really contemporary um, figures and um, a sculpture way. And so, yeah, Holly's influenced me to think more sculpturally about my baskets. You know, when I'm making them, I don't have to make them just woven creations that you're looking into. You know, I've already started doing the hats a little bit where it was a basket if you flipped it over. But otherwise, you know, it's a hat, it's a form, it's a storytelling form. And I imagine right. those as things, you know, like we wear many hats as basket weavers, you know, we're entomologists uh, because of the bug. We're botanists. We have to know our woods. We're, you know, cultural right. teachers. We're also cultural sharers. And so there's a lot of different, you know, um, roles that you take on. And then the, the shape of my eggs right. um, were always about kind of like a beginning. This is the beginning of something, you know, because everything starts somewhere. And where does it go from there? This is the beginning, but could there be an end with the bug? This is the beginning. But if we don't protect our water, what happens then? So um, mm -hmm. the shapes that I use. But um, looking at Holly's work, going back to that answer, I, 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 I'm working on a, a piece that I consider way more sculptural. And uh, that I've ever done. And I also did this uh, for the Grand Rapids Art Museum show last year. I did my first real sculpture and it was made out of, you know, sticks right. and all different kinds of things. Would that be taking a risk for you then? Do you actually no. take risk, risk in your creativity? No, I think it's expanding my creativity. No. <laughs> so what I think, you know, so Craig, I do a lot of art markets and when you do art markets, they mm -hmm. have these, you know, like rules. So you're entering a piece with a bunch of rules. And so you have to follow those rules. When I did the museum show at the Grand Rapids Art Museum, I got to say that was the most free I ever felt because I was just doing art for me to tell my story. There were no rules and I did whatever I wanted. And that's when I really became my most creative I made, you know, like things that I've never thought of making before because um, right. uh, I guess because of the kind of rules that they have. But some of our art markets have these extra categories now, like classification X. And that's for those things that don't always fall in the rules. So they're coming up with, you know, ways that we can be there. But I have to tell you, uh, museum shows are the way to go because I just felt like I could do anything, installations, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> so where are some pieces that uh, our audience could actually view some of your, your work, completed work? Uh, right now, there's a show up at the Renwick in Washington, D.C. That'll be up until I think next uh, April. And it's called In This Present Moment. And so Crafting a Better World. That's up. And so I have that one um, piece I told you about that started out from Hearts of Our People. The Smithsonian Art Museum purchased that. Mm -hmm. And then at the Field Museum, they have this great um, exhibition right now called Native Stories, Our, Our Stories, Our Truths. And um, that one, I have a, a, some items in the exhibition with my tribe, the Gun Lake tribe there. They have our uh, exhibition of our tribe in exploring what we do. So I have an egg there. And then I also made this uh, basswood net, Crane. It was the first time I ever made this. And I worked so hard on that. So if anyone goes to the Chicago field, please do look up above in the canoe and look at that little net just once. I really worked hard. <laughs> And then at the um, <laughs> the Art Institute of Chicago in their um, rice wing in the American Gallery, that um, that uh, particular basket will be up for a little bit longer of a time, unspecified, you know, longer of time. It won't be up forever, but it will be up. Not it's up for right. a more permanent exhib exhibition at this point. And so that one you can see in the American uh, Gallery Art Gallery in the rice wing. Is there a large um, art gun lake art community and collective? You know what? We don't, we have a lot of native artists. We don't have a real collective, but we have 
um, some younger cultural people that work in our cultural department that are like putting on art markets and trying to get us together. And um, as a native artist and person who loves to share, we just have a, a new person working in our culture department. I'm going to be the one that's like whispering mm -hmm. in her ears, sending emails every week, you know, let's put on classes. Let's, <laughs> let's, you know, do this, let's do this. Our tribe hasn't been really big on, you know, like, sharing basket weaving classes. They might do like one once a year. But what I think if you're going to teach your people how to do something, you need to make it available every week out of the year. And they can come when they're available right. because we all have different lives. But I think that's how it has to be done. If you're actually going to pass it on, you have to make it something that is continuous, just like the tradition has been. So um, that's how I always feel about our arts. They must always be practiced and they cannot be passed on without being practiced. And those opportunities need to be given. Well, what conditions and attitudes and behaviors uh, do you think support creativity and innovative thinking, especially in the Native American community? Um, I think opportunities, you know, mostly that just people being recognized for their talents and skills and being given the opportunities to share those talents and skills. Because some people, you know, some of our elders, they might be, you know, I've learned most of my skills from our elders. So let's say they're basket mm -hmm. weavers and that is their life skill. But, um, you know, people aren't taking advantage of that or maybe not buying those baskets. But as a basket weaver, what I found is, it was too hard to do basket weaving and have a job too. If I did a 40 hour week job, then basket weaving would be my side job. And then how could I pass it on right. and be available to those opportunities that were out there? So I kind of had to give up the health insurance if it was available or a real job, a steady paycheck to um, give my uh, devotion <laughs> to opportunities of teaching Ash. But what I find is that, um, there's have been opportunities and it's going well for me now, but there's been times when I really struggle. This is a time of year when I'm crazy busy, but when it comes January, February, right. um, I'll be like non-existent again. So those are the kind of way offs you have to, you know, look at. But if we gave those people opportunities, you know, continuously within our own tribal communities and um, made them a valued part like they are. They're the people who can pass it on. And I think our, this is something our future generations are really missing because like you said, it, it, it teaches us about our nature, um, our earth, you know, what we're trying to sustain for future generations. We're not just sustaining it because we're natives. Mm -hmm. We're sustaining it because this is what we live in and on. And without sustaining it, we will not sustain. So it really goes down to um, sustaining the earth to, to sustain our lives. But it also comes down to there's so much beauty in working with nature and over technology. I mean, if I could teach someone how much joy you could have from like chopping down a tree and pounding on it and splitting it and, you know, weaving a basket as opposed to playing a video game and getting to the end and winning. Uh, I feel like a bigger winner with my basket. <laughs> weaving. Yeah. It's that connect connectivity, I guess, to earth and your surroundings and being with nature. So what's next for Kelly church? Are you doing the uh, art market uh, circuit? You know, I do a few a year um, since the pandemic, you know, um, that was real for me. I lost my father and my stepfather during the pandemic. My brother and my aunt also passed away. So it was a, a real time for me. Mm -hmm. I take it serious. And um, so I, I I'd start doing some outdoor shows. Um, I just missed one, but we had an illness in the family. So I. Um, I'm going to be at the Herd, at the Herd Art Market in March. That's my next upcoming show okay. that I plan on attending. And then in the meantime, um, I have a website, www.woodlandarts.com. There, I'm like doing some of that fun stuff. I always like have these projects I want to do just because I think they're funny. At least I think I'm funny, Cray. I don't know about other people, but sometimes when I do stuff, I'm like, <laughs> oh, this is to be fun. And I hope I hope they get as much joy out of it as me. So right now, that's what I'm going to do a little bit this winter is do some of those fun projects I've been thinking about. And then I'll get back to being serious and, um, you know, trying to remind people how important the water is or, 
you know, how important breathing fresh air is. Right. Absolutely. So what is, uh, what's your goal? What, what, what do you want to achieve as an artist? And that's a very open-ended question. I know that. Uh, yeah. You know what? Like, what what I want to achieve as an artist. I'm an artist. <laughs> yeah. Well, as an artist, what I want to achieve as an artist, it's always nice to be able to feed yourself. So as an artist, I have to look at that aspect of it, True. you know, for sure. <laughs> Um, but as an artist, the kind of artist I am, what I hope to achieve, and right now at this point, you're you're asking me at a great um, at a great point because I've been thinking about this a lot this year. I hope to achieve the goal of teaching more, men, uh, mentoring more teachers, because I've had times when um, you know illness has been in this past two years where I wasn't sure if I could make it mm -hmm. somewhere, and when I couldn't. I started thinking about who I could ask to go and I wasn't able to think of, you know, uh, hardly one to none. And so that right there, I'm like, I need to um, empower the future generations. I need to be there for them. I need to mentor them. Um, just like my dad and my cousin, John Pigeon did for me. They were there for me. My cousin, John would you know, just be getting out of the shower and he'd stop everything and answer my questions. And my dad jumped in the car that day. I don't know <laughs> what he was doing before that, but that's the kind of teacher I want to be. I want to be there. I want to make sure I sustain it. I create some more teachers. And for me as an artist, that is my goal to create more teachers. And I'll always be creating more art. That's just a given. I have like years worth of ideas that I haven't got to. And so I think my other goal as an artist is to find time. You know, it's always about uh, being, there's always something to do. And sometimes you have to do this job to, you know, make, make that bill. But um, I'm always looking for that opportunity to just take like six months and do nothing but art. You know, maybe not even go to an right. art show, but just create, create, <laughs> create. So that's Which my goal. That's, that's a good goal to have. Definitely. Do you ever think about collaboration and how that would expand the creative process for you? Oh, yeah. I've actually collaborated with quite a few people. So I've collaborated on a checker game with Lisa Telford. Um, I did a collaboration for Indian Market. Uh, I think it was 2019 where I made a big strawberry basket. And instead of embellishing it with my mm -hmm. little strawberries on it, I asked my friends to um, make something. So like Summer Peters beaded a, um, a strawberry and Peter Boone, uh, you know, carved one. So I had nine different people on there. Juanicia Spry made a little jewelry piece it's of wow. uh, strawberry. And so it, that was really fun to do. So, yeah, collaborations are um, a really big uh it, it is a big part of what i do and i'm actually working on a a collaboration right now with um uh somebody so look for that at this year actually <laughs> for somebody yeah i know i'm like <laughs> okay we definitely we'll do that <laughs> no we'll just keep a word out it make, makes people keep on coming back and search you out yeah. like what was she talking about i'll have to look her up now um is there anything else you want to talk about to explore, to mention, to promote? Um, no, just I would like to encourage everybody to be as creative as they can. Um, find the joy in art. Look for those messages. And for our future generations, I would like to say, you know, um, it's there for you. So, you know, seek out those that are waiting for you to, um, you know, uh, listen to them. They want to teach you and tell your and story. Thank you, Miigwech. Tell your story. Oh, thank Miigwech. you, Kelly, thank you for having me. It's it, it's nice to be able to share your it's story been, with um, different audiences and to be able to um, share what's out there in our native art art world with different audiences. I mean, we're a small community, but we're a big community, um, and I think it's just getting the word out. You know. Um, and thank you so much for today and joining us and being a part of the show. It's been a complete pleasure on my part. Maybe.